going to uh, see, our, see the gospel uh, today, uh, a gospel story, one of my favorite, and uh, it goes like this, uh, Mark 4. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, uh, meaning his disciples, let us go across to the other side, he meant to the other side of the lake. Uh, they were on the Jewish side. The other side of the lake was the non-Jewish side. And it was the only way Jesus could get away from the crowds. And leaving the crowd behind, uh, they took with, uh, him with them on, in the boat, just as he was. I, I, I don't know what that means. No one does. Does that mean he didn't shower before he left? I don't know. <laughs> but they took him just as he was. Other boats were with him. A great windstorm arose, and the, and the waves beat into the boat so that the boat was already being swamped. But he, was, he Jesus, was in the stern. Where's the stern? In the back. <laughs> he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? <laughs> he woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And then the wind ceased, and there was a dead calm. And he, he said to them, meaning his disciples, and well, well, friends, we are his disciples now. He said to us, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? When I was seven years old, I first believed. The moment is etched into my memory. It will not let me go. It was in junior church in the basement of Bethel Baptist Church in Roseville, Michigan. Every Sunday we had a children's service that was a child's version of the adult service that was happening upstairs. I was often called on to play a part in the services, to take the offering, uh, to maybe read a Bible passage, and I remember on at least one occasion I sang a solo. The service always ended the same way, with a prayer time. And we were called on to bow our heads in prayer, and the worship leader put a question to us, the same question, really, every Sunday during this prayer time. Only on this particular Sunday, it seemed like the question was from God directly to me. Do you accept Jesus? as your Lord and Savior? If you do, raise your hand. And all of our heads are bowed and all of our eyes are closed. And this is just between me, God, and the worship leader. I thought, I, I, I love God, I love Jesus. There was no question about it. I couldn't help myself. I raised my hand. An adult came and got me, and we went into a nearby room by ourselves. And the adult said to me, pray after me. And I did with all my heart. I, Jimmy Bolin, now invite Jesus into my heart as Lord and Savior. I tell you, there never was a more sincere seven-year-old boy. I said the words, but even then, I knew. More importantly, I believed. That moment started a journey that led me here today. <laughs> There were other important moments along the way, but that first moment, it was the one that shaped my whole life. 
At nine years old, I felt called to serve God. I didn't tell anybody. I felt the call again when I was 17, and that time I responded. I openly declared what I felt on the inside, that God was calling me to serve Christ as a pastor of a church. From that day, when I made my public declaration, I have been preparing to serve God as pastor. And you know what? I never stopped preparing. <laughs> I've been preparing the whole way. right up to this morning. Excuse me. Right up to this morning, God has been teaching me the things I need to know to serve Christ and others. And I thought, um, I thought today I might share some of the more important things God has taught me along the way so that one last time, I might be of service to Christ and his church. The things I have learned along the way. Number one, God and your wife Susan come first. That means that for things to go well in my life, I need to check in with God through prayer and discernment. What God wants should shape my every decision. Furthermore, God expects me, I say expects me, to check with Susan before making any major decisions, or, well, any minor decisions for that matter. <laughs> the man who puts his wife first in this regard is a happy man. I didn't hear the women say amen. Amen. <laughs> Number two. Prayer has two sides, speaking and listening. It's easy to tell God what we want. It's very easy. We just close our eyes and tell God what we want. And sometimes that's where we end the prayer. But there's more to it, you see. To discern what God wants means to listen. To listen for that mysterious, holy whisper. And we hear it sometimes in moments of silence, in nature, in nature. Huh? in the Bible, in the church, and in the voices and circumstances all around us, sometimes God speaks to us in surprising ways. Number three, God doesn't cause evil, people cause evil by choosing what is bad over what is good. Evil is a byproduct of free will. The gift of free will is wonderful, but with free will comes responsibility. Everyone is responsible for doing the right thing. For example, take the fellow who had one too many drinks and then drove his truck home. He made a bad choice, an evil choice. For you see, he crossed the center line and killed an innocent family. and I did their funeral services. God didn't kill that innocent family. A man choosing to drink and drive caused those people to perish, and surely that man will be held accountable on the Day of Judgment for his bad choice, for the evil he caused. Number four. Everybody suffers, no one gets out of it, it's part of the created order. I was teaching a, a, a class once and I said, uh, everybody suffers, everybody. And a girl said, oh, I thought I was the only one. <laughs> There's no answer to the question, why me? Why not you? God doesn't cause it. God doesn't cause suffering. Suffering comes from nature, surely, but 
That's a created order. It goes on by itself. Suffering is more often caused by other people, people making bad choices. For example, the family killed by the drunk driver have friends and loved ones who will now suffer loss and grief for many, many years. Did God cause them to suffer? No. God is there to help you as you go through your suffering. Remember, Jesus suffered. And if you must, when you're suffering, think of Jesus suffering on the cross for you. And do what Jesus did. Call out to God for strength and solace. You can do this. Suffering is not visited on people because of the capriciousness of God. Number five, believing and behaving are two sides to the same coin. I grew up in a church that basically preached Martin Luther. <laughs> uh, they, uh, uh, 90% of the sermons came from the book of Romans. <laughs> All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. For the wages of sin is death and the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. There was a little piece missing, though. <laughs> because you see, believing and behaving are two sides of the same coin. Trusting God is believing. But believing means obeying God. That's behaving. Jesus taught us to practice everything he taught. It's right there. It's right there at the end of Matthew, and it's again there at the end of John. Practice everything I've taught you. You can't do that unless you're familiar with the Sermon on the Mount, the parables, and the law of love. What is the law of love? Well, you see... It's an often overlooked fact. Bob knows this very well. I, 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 I really value uh, his love for the book of John because the book of John is where, where Jesus says, a new commandment I give unto you. Ah, what? <laughs> we thought the ten was all there were. No. A new one. A new commandment I give unto you, said Jesus, that you love one another even as I have loved you. And then he repeated it. That you love one another. And then he went on to say, by this, all people shall know, if, if, if you are my disciples, if you have love one toward another. Number six. The Gospels trump. I don't know if you're familiar with the Devil's Bible. I was taught that deck of cards was the devil's Bible. I, 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 I found out later that the, the devil could use almost anything, <laughs> not just a deck of cards. The, the gospels trump. Whenever anything in the Bible seems to contradict the gospels, especially the law of love, the gospels trump, the gospels went out. You see, the gospels are the heart of the Bible. Did you know that the gospels existed as a folio, as a book? long before the New Testament was even put together, before the Bible was put together. You can see a memory of this in the way other Christians worship God. For most Christians in the world, worship begins with a procession, a procession down the aisle. A hymn is sung by the congregation, and down the aisle, down the center aisle, comes this procession. First the cross, then the choir, then the clergy, then the gospels. All four of them in one book. The Gospels. I saw this on Christmas Eve at the 11 o'clock service at Christ Church Cranbrook, which Susan uh, um, referred to number one. We were at Christ Church, and they began singing a hymn. The congregation stood and sang the hymn. And down the aisle came the procession. First came the cross. Then came the choir singing so beautifully. And then, and then came the clergy. And then came the Gospels. And I, I watched as the Gospels went forward in this, in this red book. It just, and, they, and, they, and they, they, they walked it all the way up to the, 
to the uh, altar, which is, was backed up like this one is now, and, and um, they, they put it uh, very carefully on the um, table so that it was sitting up and you could see it. This is the vestige of a memory that the Gospels existed before the New Testament. They were written, collected, and edited and were already in a folio when the, when the New Testament and then the, the Bible was put together. Around 150 A.D., the Jewish Bible, the Old Testament, was added to the front of the Gospels because the earliest Christians believed the Jewish Bible points to Jesus. The rest of the New Testament was added to the other side of the Gospels because it interprets Jesus. Bible means book. There are 66 books sewn together into one by an editor in the second century. And I believe this editor, I believe this editor to be Polycarp of Smyrna. He was an apostolic father, meaning that he actually knew one of the disciples. And I believe this because of circumstantial evidence that links him to the style and the form of the Bible. And I'd be happy to go into that with you privately. Now, Polycarp, I believe, inherited this folio of four Gospels, evidence of which we have found archaeologically um, when we find them before 150, it's just the four Gospels, and they're always in one book. We believe the Holy Spirit guarded, guided the whole process of bringing us the Bible, but you must remember always, and if you take nothing else from my ministry, remember this, the Gospels are the heart of the Bible. If anything seems to contradict what is taught in the Gospels that you find in the Bible, the Gospels trump. The Gospels win. Number seven. The church is all about serving Christ by serving others. To do that, the church must always be cultivating a loving and caring attitude. The church, focusing on serving God by serving others, is God's best instrument for peacemaking, for justice-making, and for serving the wider community. The church is to be God's hands and feet in this world. Support the church, and particularly this church. For this church has a mission yet. This church has a mission yet. And this church's best days are still ahead. Number eight, rely on the Holy Spirit. If you have an open heart, God's Spirit will find ways to help you, to nudge you, to keep you focused on what is important in life. Number nine, have fun, make fun, be fun, enjoy. <laughs> uh, uh, amen? Amen. Uh, uh, God didn't put us here to be sour pusses. <laughs> God didn't, didn't put us here to whine and moan and groan. <laughs> uh, God expects to have fun. Jesus had fun. I know that because he, he told a silly story about, about a camel trying to go through the eye of a little needle. <laughs> and uh, I'm sure everybody laughed then. It lost a lot in translation. Number 10. The great commandment of Jesus is not two commandments, but only one. You'll notice that, that Jesus uh, called it one commandment, didn't he? For you see, to love God is to love your neighbor, and to love your neighbor is to love God. And those are the ten most important things God's taught me along the way. Glean from them what you will. Dear Lord, thank you for teaching me along the way. You are teaching all of us, really, and we all have our list. May Bethany glean for its use as needed from what you've taught me along the way. 
And may Bethany Church stay ever focused on Jesus and his love. Amen. Will you please uh, stand and join me as we sing together, uh, Go Tell It on the Mountain. I'll say, I'm going to keep working for Bethany for another month, and you're going to see me around. And don't, uh, don't, yeah, uh, I, I, I'll, my, I'll be, I have to be called, wait. <laughs> but instead, after January 1st, instead of pastor, I'm, I'm a consultant. Wink, 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 wink. Uh, the Social Security stuff, it's Social Security stuff. Um, but a rose by any other name, huh? <laughs> a rose by any other name. Um, and so uh, I'm looking forward to the, re the retirement party on January 19th, and um, I hope you'll all uh, be here for the service as we worship God, because I, that's, that's the context in which we should celebrate, and worship in God. And uh, there's some things, surprises I don't know about. Apparently you do, but I don't. <laughs> and um, I had to hide my baby pictures from my wife, too. <laughs> um, but, um, but I'll be around, and remember, I'm not moving away... I'm just retiring. <laughs> I have to stay away from the church after January 31st for a while. Um, until a new pastor's in place and the new pastor and I have a relationship. Um, that's protocol. That's, that's the ethics that we all agree to. So, uh, and it's really for the best. Um, but that doesn't mean you, can, uh, you can't talk to me. You can talk to me. You, you just can't. Bring up church business, that's all. <laughs> and so, uh, but you call me about other things uh, just as friends, and I'll, I'll be available to you after January 31st. Um, today, uh, uh, being the last uh, Sunday which I'm going to conduct service as Pastor Bethany, um, I, uh, Susan asked me to uh, do the Arianic blessing at the end. Well, we've come to the end, and... Um, You see, mo most of the Jewish Bible got written down during the Babylonian exile in the 6th century. But uh, two centuries earlier, uh, we found a verse from uh, the Jewish Bible, um, a prayer that was put into the mouth of Aaron, Moses' brother. Archaeologists digging at the site of Lachish, um, which had been overrun by the Assyrians in the year 722 B.C. Um, they, at, a, at, at the 722, the 8th century level, they, they found a, a bracelet. And it was, made out of, uh, it was made out of silver. And on the bracelet were ancient Hebrew letters. And um, when they gave the bracelet to a Hebrew scholar... Um, He started crying. <laughs> For what it said was, May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go in peace.